Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all. Um, listening to uh, Bill, I was thinking about all of the synergies between StoryCorps and, and the work you do, and I just feel so privileged and honored to be here. Uh, as Commissioner Sutton said, this is family, and it feels like family for, for StoryCorps as well. Um, and I hope uh, when I play some stories today, you guys will end up agreeing with that. So let, let me just start by asking, who, who here, has anybody here participated in StoryCorps? You, okay, and, and who here had knows StoryCorps from the radio, has heard of StoryCorps? Okay, and who here has never heard of StoryCorps and has no idea what I'm doing up here? Wow, a lot of people. <laughs> okay, well, so I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a very brief uh, history of StoryCorps, but I, I'll start a little earlier than that because I feel like there's, um, there's, there's just so many connections between StoryCorps and, and the supportive housing community. I used to be a, a public radio documentary maker before starting StoryCorps a dozen years ago. And one of the, one of the um, kind of uh, aha moments that led to the creation of StoryCorps happened when I did a documentary uh, down at the Sunshine Hotel on the Bowery, um, one of the last flop houses down there. And uh, I did a radio documentary, and then I did a book of, of oral histories and photographs of the men who lived at the Sunshine and a couple of other hotels. The Sunshine, I, I think, is not there. It's not, I think there may be three or four guys left in there. Uh, and I, I remember when um, we, we, we did a book of these, these photographs, and I went back with the galley, which is an early version of the book, into one of the hotels, probably the Sunshine. And I, um, and I was showing it to different people in the book, and I showed it to one of the men in the book who grabbed the book out of my hand, and he looked at his photograph and his oral history, and you know if you put up that slide, Andrew? As you probably know, there are the long hallways in the, in the, in the, um, in the flop houses, the old flop houses. And this man looked at his photograph and his oral history, and he, he sat there for 30 seconds just staring at it. And then he grabbed the book out of my hand, and he started running down the long hallway in that flop house, holding the book over his head, shouting, I exist, I exist. And that became kind of the clarion call for StoryCorps, which started about a dozen years ago. And it's a very simple idea. We built a um, booth in Grand Central Terminal where you can come, anyone can come, with a loved one to listen to them, to honor them, or with a friend, or with a colleague, or with someone they serve. You go into this sacred space, this dark, this booth that is, the lights are low, complete silence, and you sit across from, say, your grandmother for 40 minutes. There's a facilitator who works for StoryCorps in the corner and you listen and you talk. Many people think of it as, if I had 40 minutes left to live, what would I say to, what would I ask of this person who I'm, I'm sitting and, and speaking with? Very intense emotional interviews. At the end of the 40 minutes, you get a CD or a digital copy. Another one stays with us and it goes to the Library of Congress so your great, great, great grandkids can someday get to know your grandmother uh, through her voice and story. So it started as this kind of crazy idea. I had no idea what was gonna happen. Um, uh, and, uh, and it worked in these kind of magical ways. And I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the history of StoryCorps, play you some stories, and then, um, and then play you uh, some stories that relate to the, the, the work you do and the people that you serve here. So um, the first story I'm going to play is from very, very early on in StoryCorps. And I, I think what happens in the booth when people have this experience of, of, of being listened to is that it reminds people that they matter and they won't be forgotten. And I, I know that the work that, that you all do every day has so much to do with, with listening to your, your clients. This is an interview that happened probably in the first or second week of, of StoryCorps. Um, and uh, this is a man named uh, Danny Parasa, as you see, and his wife, Annie. And Danny was an OTB clerk uh, living in Brooklyn. Annie is a nurse. And uh, they came to StoryCorps to talk about their first date which had happened 25 years before. So this is just a taste of what happens in StoryCorps, a very early interview, Danny and Annie Parasa talking about their first date. She started to talk and I said, listen, I'm gonna deliver a speech. I said, at the end, you're gonna to wanna to go home. I said, you represent a 34 letter word. I said, that word is love. I said, if we're going anywhere, we're going down the aisle because I'm too tired, too sick and too sore to do any other damn thing. And she turned around and she said, well, of course I'll marry you. And the next morning, I called her as early as I possibly could. 
And he always gets up early. <laughs> to, make, to make sure she hadn't changed her mind, and she hadn't. And uh, every year on, on April 22nd, around 3 o'clock, I call her and ask her if it was today, would she do it again? And so far, the answer's been the same. Yeah, 25 times yes. <laughs> you, you see, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often. I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming from me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio, and it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. If I don't have a note on the kitchen table, I think there's something wrong. You write a love letter to me well, every the only morning. thing that could possibly be wrong is I couldn't find a silly pen. To my princess. The weather out today is extremely rainy. I'll call you at 11.20 in the morning. It's a romantic weather And report. I love you, I love you, I love you. When a guy is happily married, no matter what happens at work, no matter what happens in the rest of the day, there's a shelter when you get home. There's a knowledge, knowing that you can hug somebody without them throwing you downstairs and saying, get your hands off me. And it, it, being married is like having a color television set. You never want to go back to black and white. <laughs> So Danny, Danny and Annie, um, we, you know, we fell in love with Danny. This, he, he personifies, both Danny and Annie, so much of what StoryCorps is about and so much of what speaks to the core of the work you do. And it's the poetry and the power and the grace and the beauty in the words and the stories of people all around us when we take the time to listen. Um, this was, as I said, very early at StoryCorps. And you know, one of the secrets of StoryCorps quietly kept secrets is when we open this booth where you can come and you know honor someone and listen to them no one actually came now we have like lines of like thousands of people to get in but in the beginning we actually had one woman who came 200 times she brought everyone she'd ever met she'd meet people on the subway and bring them into story court <laughs> And, and Danny and Annie also were able to come many times, and they did. They loved StoryCorps. Danny brought every character he'd ever met, uh, major league umpires and undercover uh, drug enforcement agents. And, it, and, it, it got, and he would bring Annie back to read love letters, and it got to the point where Danny would call us on a Friday and say, you know, I'm having a cataract operation on Monday. Do you need me to come in on Wednesday and document it? And we'd say, Danny, sure, whatever you want to do. Um, a couple of years later, Danny was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and we ended up um, re, um, that week naming that original booth in Grand Central Terminal the Danny and Annie Parasa booth at a ceremony. And then the next week, uh, Danny was too sick to come to the booth, but asked if he could record a final interview with Annie. So we went to their house in Bay Ridge and, um, and, and recorded an interview with them. And this is Danny and Annie Parasa at their home in Bay Ridge. The illness is not hard on me. It's just, you know, the finality of it. And him, he goes along like a trooper. Listen, even downhill, a car doesn't roll unless it's pushed, and you're giving me a great push. The deal of it is, we try to give each other hope, and not hope that I'll live, hope that she'll do well after I pass, hope that people will support her, hope that if she meets somebody and likes him, she marries him. You know, he has everything planned, you know. I'm working on it. She said it was her call. She wants to walk out behind the casket alone. I guess that's the way to do it, because when we were married, you know how your brother takes you down, your father takes you down? She said, well, I don't know which of my brothers to walk in with. I don't want to offend anybody. I said, I got a solution. I said, you walk in with me, you walk out with me. And the other day, I said, who's going to walk down the aisle with you behind the casket? You know, to support her. And she said, nobody. I walked in with you alone. I walked out with you alone. Mm -hmm. There's a thing in life where you have to come to terms with dying. Well, I haven't come to terms with dying yet. I want to come to terms with being sure that you understand that my love for you up to this point was as much as it could be and will be as much as it could be for eternity. I always said the only thing I have to give you is a poor gift and it's myself. And I always gave it. And if there's a way to come back and give it, I'll do that too. Do you have the Valentine's Day letter there? Yeah. My dearest wife, this is a very special day 
It is a day on which we share our love, which still grows after all these years. Now that love is being used by us to sustain us through these hard times. All my love, all my days, and more. Happy Valentine's Day. I could write on and on about her. She lights up the room in the morning when she tells me to put both hands on her shoulders so she can support me. She lights up my life when she says to me at night, wouldn't you like a little ice cream? Or would you please drink more water? I mean, those aren't very romantic things to say, but they stir my heart. In my mind, in my heart, there has never been, there is not now, and never will be another any. So we recorded that interview on a, on a Thursday, and uh, Danny, uh, we broadcast on NPR the next Friday, and Danny died about two hours after the broadcast. We received thousands and thousands and thousands of letters and emails of condolence and um, uh, gave them to Annie, and she actually buried a copy with Danny, because he, he was a guy who, um, a, as you can see, you know, he was, he was five feet tall, he had crossed eyes, he had one snaggle tooth, and the guy had more romance in his little pinky than everyone in Hollywood, all those leading men in Hollywood put together. But he was also someone who had been teased, uh, and you know, people would make fun of him, uh, uh, and, and he never felt that he had a voice. Annie buried a copy of those letters with him, and, um, and she also kept a copy, and still to this day, many, many years later, reads a copy of a letter she received from a public radio listener instead of the letter she would have gotten from Danny. So that's kind of the beginning of, of StoryCorps. Uh, and, and over the last 11 years, it's grown enormously. We've now done about 60,000 interviews, 65,000 interviews all across the country. It's the largest collection of human voices um, ever gathered. We, um, we, we are, we're very much a, uh, we, we are, we're a, a social justice organization. Half of our slots are held for people who know us through NPR. The other half we work with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of community organizations across the country each year, including uh, organizations that some folks in this, in this room work for or run, um, to make sure that their clients, the people that they serve, have the opportunity to be listened to in this way at StoryCorps. So like supportive housing, a very simple, um, uh, beautiful idea that works. And I, I just want to take a moment um, to thank someone who is more responsible than anyone else, including uh, myself, for the organization that uh, StoryCorps is today, and she's one of you. Um, Donna Galeno ran homeless services for the Red Cross for 20 years um, and lives and breathes the ethos of supportive housing. Uh, I had the idea for StoryCorps, but Donna built the organization that StoryCorps is uh, today from the ground up with precision and fidelity and fierceness and a huge heart, and runs it like a military operation for good. Um, so I feel blessed to be working with her, and I just wanted to thank Donna Galeno, who runs program for StoryCorps. Would you stand, Donna? She won't stand. Uh, there, I, I'm going to play a story uh, that relates to another person who came out of the supporting housing uh, world. Uh, uh, Melvin Reeves, who um, focused for decade, uh, decades was delivering services to homeless mothers and their children uh, here in, in New York City, um, what has been at StoryCorps for about a decade. And his first job at StoryCorps was creating an initiative called GRIO. So StoryCorps launched about 10 big national initiatives over the years. Um, honoring and focusing on individual groups of, of folks who we feel um, their voices should be raised. So our first was with 9-11 families. Everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th comes to StoryCorps to leave a record of that person's life. And GRIO, which is now the largest collection of African-American voices ever gathered, um, uh, is uh, it's a West African word for storyteller and um, honors the stories of African-American families across the country. So I'm going to play one GRIO story. Um, and, and this is from the first month after we launched down at the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta. Um, I, Melvin and I had the honor of going down to the King Center after that first month and playing stories and, and listening to the folks who had participated. And one of the people who was in the audience that night 
um, was Lynn Weaver, who had done one of the first Grio interviews with his daughter Kimberly. Um, she had interviewed him, and he talked about his father, whose name was Ted Weaver. Ted Weaver was a janitor and a chauffeur in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, Lynn came to remember him. My father was everything to me. And it's actually kind of difficult talking about him without becoming very emotional. Up until, you know, he died. Every decision I made, I'd always call him. And he would never tell me what to do, but he would always listen and say, well, what do you want to do? And he made me feel that I could do anything that I wanted to do. I can remember when we integrated the schools that there were many times when I was just scared. And uh, I, I didn't think that uh, I would survive. And I'd look up and he'd be there. And whenever I saw him, I knew that I was safe. You know, I always tell you that your, your mama is the smartest person I've ever met. But I think my father ranks right up there as, as brilliant. When I was in high school, I was taking algebra and I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to do my homework. And I got frustrated and said, I just can't figure this out. I'm just, so my father said, what's the problem? He came by, he said, what's the problem? And I said, that's this algebra. And he said, well, let me look at it. I said, Dad, they didn't even have algebra in your day. <laughs> And I went to sleep. And around four o'clock that morning, he woke me up. He said, come on, son, get up. He set me at the kitchen table and he taught me algebra. What he had done is sit up all night and read the algebra book. And then he explained the problems to me so I could do them and understand them. <laughs> and to this day, I live my life trying to be half the man my father was, just half the man. And, uh, I would be a success if my children loved me half as much as I loved my father. The day after that event, um, Melvin and I received an email that says, you'll never know how honored and touched I was by the playing of the remembrance of my dad. After I got home, I realized that the evening of the Grio reception was the anniversary of my father's death. Even in death, he continues to touch me with his love. This project has touched me more than you'll ever know. Signed, Lynn Weaver, Chairman of Surgery, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. So that was another kind of important moment for us, thinking about Ted Weaver as uh, the, the janitor and chauffeur in Knoxville, who was the smartest and greatest man that his son Lynn had ever met, um, who had sacrificed so much, uh, and to me is the great American hero, the kind of person we should be holding up to our kids as examples of who they can and should grow up to be, the kind of person we should be building statues to and, and, and honoring and thanking for their intelligence and wisdom and courage. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of the folks who, who you serve as well. Uh, I'm going to play some, some stories that have to do with the populations of folks um, that, that you're involved with and then um, answer some questions if you have any questions. Um, so I picked, I picked a few stories uh, that, that kind of resonated with, with the work of, of supporting, uh, supportive housing. And, and the first one I'm going to play speaks to kind of the, ah, I'm not going to play that one. I get to choose whatever I want. I'm up here. This is, this is one I've never played before publicly. Um, and I heard it a, a week ago on our podcast, and uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring it to you. Um, uh, this, is, this is a story that takes place out of Texas. And um, uh, it's, it's a young man, as you see, Darius Clark Monroe. Um, when he was in high school in, uh, in Texas, in a small town in Texas, uh, he was an honor student who had never been in trouble. Um, but uh, after his 16th birthday, he robbed a bank in this town, Stafford, Texas. Um, it was an armed robbery uh, at gunpoint with his friends. Um, decades later, he sat down with one of the victims of that crime. Uh, David Ned, who's a pastor, was, uh, was a customer in the bank. Uh, and they came together uh, to talk about that incident that happened a couple of de decades ago. So this is Darius Clark Monroe and David Ned. How did you get to that point where you said, I'm going to rob a bank? What was happening at my house was that things weren't going well in terms of the finances. My parents were working all the time. And once they told me that we were in like $25,000, $30,000 of debt, I was thinking, how am I going to help? Because nobody else is going to come save the day. And so one day on TV, there was this guy who had robbed this bank. 
And I was struck by how easy it seemed. Did you really think you was gonna get away with this? I literally thought no one would ever find out. It took almost four weeks before I was arrested and then sent to prison. How many years did it was given you? Five. Five years. Mm -hmm. When I got out, I wanted to apologize to the people who were inside the bank. And when I spoke to you, it was the first time I got to truly understand the seriousness of what I did. When you came into the bank, you made us all lay on the floor. Can you imagine laying on the floor and all you hear is that shotgun, clack, clack. Everything in me was shaking. And I kept saying to myself, it's over. I used to think I wasn't scared of nothing. They used to call me Brave Dave. I figured if anybody tried to rob me, I said, well, they're gonna have to take my life to get my money. I don't work too hard for it. Mm -hmm. So that was hard for me because I had to come to grips with that. And one thing that helped me when you came by and asked me to forgive you, years later, I thought about my son. He could have been put in jail because he's been through some stuff, but should he ever turn his life around, I would like that somebody he may have taken advantage of would give him a second chance. It has been incredible once we've given a second, third, fourth shot and having you be a part. This has given me hope. I'm really proud of you. And uh, I don't know if you've got a good relationship with your dad, but if you don't, he's the one that missed out on a great son. And I'm here to do whatever it is I need to do 17 years later to help you be a great young man. Let's go to North Carolina. Oh. I, what I hope happens is that every week when we play these stories on NPR, um, and we also have um, animations that you can find on the web, that we just kind of shake people on the shoulder and remind them, you know, this is what's important. This is what's important. Because there is kind of so much white noise and nonsense, and in the media, just absolute bullshit that we're uh, surrounded with. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's real and what's an advertisement. And I think the power of a story authentically told, you know, this is kind of the opposite of reality TV. Nobody comes to get rich. Nobody comes to get famous. It's an act of generosity and love. And it also, I mean, if StoryCorps has changed me over these last 12 years, it's made me much more hopeful. Um, and uh, I, I feel like that, that hope that, that um, rings through these voices and stories is what you do and the gift that you give to people every single day. Um, this is uh, Willie Davis and Yalitza Castro. Um, Yalitza is an undocumented housekeeper, worker in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and at StoryCorps, she remembered a cold night when she was driving with her kids and saw a homeless man with a sign asking for help. Her daughter asked why they weren't taking him to dinner, and she turned around the car to find him, but he was gone. Um, at that moment, she decided that she was going to start cooking meals for homeless men. And she's been doing that every other Saturday, starting uh, in, on Christmas a few years ago. So here's an excerpt of a conversation she had with one of the men uh, who's eaten many of those meals, Willie Davis. Willie, you remember the first dinner together? Yes, I do. Church band came, picked some of those guys up from the men's shelter. And I'm like, why is this lady coming to the roughest place in Charlotte to do this for us. So I must be fishy about this, but I said, I'm gonna go. And when I got out of the van, I smelled the cooking, and then I saw you. I saw a smile on your face. It made everybody feel welcome and comfortable. And when you cooked, it was like what my mom used to cook. You know, I haven't had that kind of feeling in a long time, and I really needed that. That night, I finished all the stuff in the kitchen, and when I got to the buffet tables, you guys all together start singing the Feliz Navidad song, and I start crying. Everybody just gave you a standing ovation pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you don't make us feel homeless. You know us by names and faces, and we know y'all care. Before I met you, Lisa, I pretty much almost gave up. But that home-cooked meal, it just brought my self-esteem back up. Now I've got my own place and... It's really amazing. And that gives me motivation because I'm here in the United States by myself with my kids. And I know that it's hard. That dinner is not just 
a meal is try to make your guys feel like we are family. Every other Saturday feel like Christmas to me. That's why I keep coming. I'm always gonna keep coming. I have a lot of stories. I could keep here all day. Seriously, I'm like thinking, what, what am I going to play? You know, and it's because so many of the stories we do relate to the work that you do. But, I mean, almost every one. Um, I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll play a few more. Well, let me see. Okay. So let's do, um, uh, this, this is a story that, um, that I've also never played before. And this takes place in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Um, and this is uh, Bonnie Brown, who came to StoryCorps with her teenage daughter, uh, Myra. Um, to talk about um, Bonnie as, as a mom. When you found out you were pregnant with me, like, what did you think? I was very happy and I was also scared. Why were you scared? Because I had never been pregnant before. I never had really an idea of how to care for a baby. Did you ever feel like I was too much to handle, like ever? No. I think because I'm different, it might seem hard for me. But I was going to give it all I got, no matter what. When I was a kid, I didn't realize that you were different. And you actually had to tell me, because I wasn't figuring it out. I said to you, I said, Myra, I know I'm not like your friend's mother's, but I'm doing the best I can. And you said, it's OK, Mommy. And that made me feel so good. Has my disability affected your life? I guess, like when I was little, you had to go in for my parent-teacher conference, and like as a disclosure, I was like, my mom's disabled, but the day after the interview, my teacher said that you seemed really intelligent, and that made me feel embarrassed. <laughs> Why? Because I kind of felt bad that I had said that, and then you'd gone and you'd been fine. No offense taken, you were just giving our heads up, right? Yeah. What's the hardest thing that you've overcome? Being hurt from people. Not physical, but just like, like emotionally. Yeah, yeah. There were times when we would go out and people would just blatantly stare, and I would say something. I guess I'm kind of protective. I'm really thankful because you understand me and you love me and you accept me, and thank you for that. I don't know, you kind of make it seem like I tolerate you. I love you. You're a good parent, and just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you do anything less for me. You want me to succeed. Yes, I do. I want you to make something of yourself. I want you to know that even though our situation is unique, I'm happy that I'm in it because I'm happy that I'm with you. Thank you, Mara. And I feel the same way. I will never change it for anything in this world. I'm going to play a story from, we, so we've done a bunch of special initiatives. I'll play this story and then we can, um, we can, we can talk for a few minutes. This is, um, we've done, uh, we, 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 our most recent special initiative is called the Military Voices Initiative. Um, and uh, and uh, since uh, Commissioner Sutton's here, I thought I'd play uh, at least one, or one story from, from this initiative. This is focusing on post 9-11. Uh, veterans and their families, and we've done um, thousands of interviews across the country with them. Um, and uh, this is a broadcast from just a week or two ago. Um, I'm going to do this one. This is uh, Scott uh, Skiles and his son, Zach. Uh, Marine Corporal Skiles uh, served in Iraq. Uh, when he came back home, he couldn't uh, hold the job, and he ended up homeless. Um, so Zach and his son, uh, Scott, who had never sat down to talk about that experience, uh, came to StoryCorps uh, a month or two ago um, to talk about that experience and remember um, when, uh, when they said goodbye to each other uh, at Zach's base before he deployed overseas. I remember saying to you, every gift that I've been given, I don't have a better one than to be your dad. And I remember you smiling, saying, I love you too, Dad. And then you got out of the car and went to war. So what was life like after you came home? I was pretty sure someone was going to kick down my door, and I was scared to go to sleep. I couldn't sustain employment. I couldn't pay rent and pay for groceries. It all just kind of fell apart, and then I was homeless. 
the crazy thing was that I didn't think that there was anything super wrong. You know, the nighttime, I stayed on coastal trails and hiking trails, and in the daytime, I could just pass out at a park. There was a time period where I didn't know where you were, mm -hmm. and it is difficult to watch anyone let go of hope. But when it's your son, it's excruciating. I remember great relief that you decided to go into inpatient treatment. And I remember one night you getting out of the car to walk back into the treatment building. It was dark and your head was kind of down. And for a moment, I could feel the weight you were carrying. As I watched you walk into that building, I uttered these two words that I don't know if they were some kind of prayer or not, but they just came out, my son. And I was absolutely overcome with grief and love and the beginning of hope. What is life like for you now? It's pretty cool. <laughs> you graduated undergrad? Yes. I heard summa cum laude. <laughs> I, I'm just asking. That's what I heard. Yeah. I remember my dad saying this to me, and I feel it is so true between you and I. It is your life, so you have the last word. But then as your dad, that gives me the second to the last word. And the second to the last word is, I believe in you. And I'm on your side. I think that if you were going to sum up um, what StoryCorps is all about, these stories we share, the interviews that happens in the booth. Um, if, if you're going to do that in one line, it's that every life matters, and every life matters equally and infinitely. And uh, that is the work that you do every day. Um, a couple questions. Any questions? And if no questions, I can do stories. Usually I just stand here and wait for questions, but I can just play <laughs> stories instead. Anything? Uh, yes. So the question is, how long is the session and do we edit it down? So each of these 60,000 sessions we've done is 40 minutes. And we look at, um, at those uh, 40 minutes in each of those 60,000 sessions is equally valuable and important, sometimes a sacred moment in, in people's lives. Um, and we call that access to the StoryCorps experience. The content that we play, the three minutes we play, uh, it's three minutes edited out of about three or 400 40-minute interviews, so the ratio is really tiny. And these are stories that have this kind of universal quality that almost demand that they be played. Again, no better, no worse than any other interview. But, but um, hopefully what, what, what these, we, we hope happens when you hear these on Friday on NPR is that you're going to be, you know, radio, audio, the voice is so intimate. It's like the soul is contained in the human voice. And we hope that, and you'll kind of walk in the footsteps of someone who you might have thought was a little bit different than you. And most people still listen to radio in the car with headphones, and it's almost like um, whoever it is um, uh, 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 of any of these interviews is almost whispering in your ear. And we hope that just for a moment you recognize a little bit of yourself in that person and uh, that a, a bridge is built of understanding and of listening and, and of compassion. And that's what we're trying to do with StoryCorps. You know, I think we're at the very beginning of a long road, and the dream with StoryCorps is that someday we'll touch the lives of every American family and that we'll move the needle in this country just a little bit on helping us become more compassionate, listening better, uh, and recognizing the dignity and, and humanity in, in every life. Another question? Yes, sir. So the question was, what, what other uses do we have for these sessions? So we have, um, as I said, we have animations, we have books, we have radio broadcasts. Um, and I, and, and um, since you asked, I'll play one very quick um, interview from another program that we're developing called StoryCorps U. And StoryCorps U is a positive youth development uh, curriculum. It's a year-long curriculum for 10th and 11th graders that um, where, where um, kids in very high-need schools are played um, stories, um, presented stories that speak to them and learn the story core interview technique to help them recognize the power of their own voice and to feel a connection to teachers um, and to feel that the teachers understand them and to help teachers understand them. And I'll play a very 
quick clip of Celeste Davis Carr. Um, she, um, she is a teacher um, at a high need school in Chicago. And in one of her class assignments, her student, uh, Aaron, whose last name we're not going to use, uh, revealed that he'd been homeless for the past several months in his recording. Um, his teacher had no idea. Um, and a year later, she came back with Aaron to StoryCorps um, to talk about um, the revelation uh, and, um, and how that affected their relationship. When you shared your StoryCorps recording with everyone, how did you feel, Aaron? I felt like a big load was let off because, mm -hmm. I mean, I just said it. I don't know what made me say it, but I'm like, let me just be honest and just get it out. I was scared because I felt helpless. I didn't know what to do. But at the same time, I felt I had an obligation to try my best to help you. Yeah, I didn't even know you actually listened to that one. I you listened know. to all of them, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really think that I would ever tell a teacher, but it makes me know that you're special because you care. Because mm -hmm. sometimes kids were bullying me, throwing chairs, throwing glass and stuff at me. So overall, how do you feel? You have more friends this year? Yes, I have more friends this year. So it's better than last year? Yeah. I'm in the foster home now. Been since October. Do you feel different living in a foster home? It's good, actually. I feel comfortable where I am now. It kind of feels like home. So can I tell you one thing that I really admire about you, Aaron? Because I've never told you. Do you know that, how strong you are? <laughs> no. You never realized that? No. But you have a strength that no matter what anyone says about you or they do to you, you don't change who you are as a person. And a lot of people don't have that strength. So I admire that about you. Thank you. Don't make me cry again, though. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you happy. Just your smile is the best moments of you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Maybe one more question. Um, yes, I'm sorry not that I don't see anybody in the back. I usually like to pick people, but yes, front. How can you use the power of StoryCorps to advocate? Oh, what a great question. So how can we use the power of StoryCorps to advocate and to raise up the voices of the people that you serve? So we've had a very exciting um, eight weeks in, uh, at StoryCorps. Um, uh, we uh, launched an app about eight weeks ago uh, that uh, has really changed the face of, 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 of StoryCorps. Uh, 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 as as um, Laura mentioned, I gave a TED Talk, um, and we won something called the TED Prize, where they uh, gave us the funding to create this. So now everybody can, on their cell phones, can download the StoryCorps app, and, um, and it's kind of a digital facilitator. Again, the facilitators who work for StoryCorps are these people who work for us for a year or two. It's a pretty high burnout job. It's very intense, not so different than, than, than the jobs that you all do, bearing witness to these interviews and collecting the wisdom of humanity. And what we created eight weeks ago was a digital facilitator um, where basically it walks you through the StoryCorps interview process. On your cell phone, you can do a StoryCorps interview. When you're done with it, one tap and it uploads to the Library of Congress. So that means that we can achieve scale in a way that we never did before. One of the things we're going to do, for instance, is over Thanksgiving break, we're going to ask every US history teacher in the country to assign to their um, students to record a grandparent or another elder. Um, so that, uh, in theory, we could record a whole generation and honor a whole generation of Americans over one single weekend. Um, I said in my, in my TED talk that, uh, and it, it, is the, it was the most important line for me in that talk, where I said that uh, the dream with this app is that someday we can all go into hospitals and to um, senior centers and uh, to homeless shelters and maybe even to prisons and to raise the voices and honor the voices of those who feel least heard uh, and who most need to be heard. And that is my dream with this app and our dream with StoryCorps, to honor those voices, to raise those voices, to help folks recognize how much their lives matter, that truth of how much their lives matter. So we have a session um, at 145. Uh, Dina Zemsky, who's here and works with us, will be 
um, doing a session to show you how to use the app in your work. So I hope that everyone will join us at that session. Um, uh, any, uh, I'm going to play one more story. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play this because it was just requested of me. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with, um, with uh, the work you do other than it's about humanity. Uh, and this is just a... Um, this is just a, one of the animated story core stories we've done. These are two cousins in Florida um, uh, uh, talking to each other about a formative figure from their life and, uh, and uh, enjoy. Let's talk about Mr. Ms. Vine. Lizzie Devine. Ms. Devine was a wiry lady. She wore summer dresses. She had a bandana and a straw hat. And she was the only person I knew that had more power than my grandmother. She wasn't a mean person. She was stern. Stern, yes, very stern. You know, when she said something, she meant exactly what she said. Right. In fact, she was our Sunday school teacher. The only thing that would keep you from going to Sunday school you had to have one foot on banana peel and the other in the grave. Absolutely. That's the only There's thing. There's no, no excuse. You had to go. Had to go. One of the things that you prayed for when you were in Mrs. Devine's class was, Lord, please let me get old enough to get out of this class. <laughs> she did the catechism. Who made you? God. Where is God? Everywhere. <laughs> she went through and you said, oh, Lord, have mercy, please. <laughs> this Mr. Devine would come in on Sunday mornings to take us to Sunday school. And, and, and when I saw her come, Sherry, I thought the leaves would be blowing up the trees and the sky would go black and the clouds would come in. And she'd come in the house one morning and say, good morning, children. And everybody, my mother on down, said, good morning, Miss Devine. And she says, it's time to go to Sunday school this morning, children. I said, Miss Devine, I can't go to Sunday school today. Uh, she said, no. I said, no, ma'am. She says, why not? She said, because I, I said, my mother didn't bring enough clothes for me to go to Sunday school this, this morning. She said, oh, no. I said, no, ma'am. She said, well, what do you have? What kind of clothes do you have? I said, all I have, Mr. Vine, are my pajamas and my tennis shoes. She said, well, that's okay, honey. Put your tennis shoes on. We go to Sunday school. I looked at my mother, and she looked away, Sharon. <laughs> Mr. Vine made me walk two blocks in my pajamas and my tennis shoes. I had to sit in church with my friends. <laughs> do a Sunday school my pajamas and my tennis shoes. I will tell you, Sharon, I'll, I'll never lie again. <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Devine was always there to take care of us. Right. But when Ms. Devine braided your hair, your eyes went up like this. <laughs> you had to sleep on soft pillows because, I mean, boy, she had it tight. Mm -mm -mm. And Ms. Devine had mango trees all over her yard. But Ms. Devine never brought you a mango until it was rotten. <laughs> <laughs> it would be it would smell like liquor. <laughs> That's when she brought you mango. <laughs> but you know what? That's the kind of stuff that we got growing up and and, and I'll never forget that. Laura mentioned that quote um, uh, that Mr. Rogers used to carry around in his pocket, um, which is a beautiful quote, which goes something like, uh, it's impossible not to love someone whose story you've heard. You all in this room have heard a lot of stories, and you've got a lot of love in your hearts. And we as a city and as a country and as human beings love you for the work that you do every day. Keep on. Never give up. I know that this kind of work, someone once described StoryCorps as um, hard work and blood work and love work. And sometimes I know it can feel a little bit hopeless, but you just got to pick yourself up <laughs> and go in the next day and, and do it again because the work that you're doing is, is so important. And you do remind us all that every life matters. 
um, and you change people's lives and you give us hope, you give me hope. Of all the, I've done many, many speeches uh, in my life and I can't think of one where I felt more privileged to be in front of a group. Um, thank you so much, keep up the great work, keep listening, keep loving, thank you. So, so incredibly powerful, right? Um, what an amazing, amazing experience that you've shared with us, Dave. And um, we're, we're going to be working with StoryCorps and um, in the supportive housing community and maybe having a supportive housing StoryCorps day. So stay tuned for that. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner Sutton. We have a great day ahead of us. Uh, it's almost exactly 10.30, we're right on time, so please hustle off to your first panel, and thank you for coming.